You got to sit down and chat with Chelsea Handler. She's getting back uh, on, she's doing stand-up again? Yeah, she is. She has a whole new HBO Max special. It's called Evolution. And I first met Chelsea when I was a guest on her show, and we became friends in an instant. She's self-deprecating, wildly funny, and as we're all aware, often shocking. She also has one of the biggest hearts around. For seven seasons, Chelsea Handler starred in her wildly popular late-night show, Chelsea Lately. You're not their mother, you're dating. (laughs) She shared her bold take on everything from pop culture to relationships to politics. She's the best-selling author of half a dozen books on her life, her antics, and her philosophies, with titles such as Are You There, Vodka? It's Me, Chelsea, shocking and charming her way into stardom and the audience's hearts, including my own. Oh, we might have to address the fact that we call each other sissy. Well, sissy means like we're sisters, your sister. I call all the people in my life who are sisters sissy. And when I met you and your sister, it's like we bonded over the fact that we were so happy to have sisters in our life. And now she's back on stage with an HBO Max special called Chelsea Handler Evolution, a deeply personal and deeply funny take on dating, love, and her frequent visits to therapy really tricky time right now. I figured it was time to go to a real therapist. He said, I think you lack empathy. It's been six years since your last special. Why did we have to wait so long? This special is called Evolution. Talk to me about how you've evolved in the last year. I was able to put it down in a book, and then I thought, if I could turn this into a stand-up show, and that would make me interested in going back to stand up. You know, if I could take this narrative of going into therapy, of realizing I had like, you know, a total attitude problem, I thought, oh, I'm just great. I'm really honest and I tell people the truth. What's everybody's problem? And therapy to me was just one of like the most ridiculously funny, embarrassing, humiliating experiences that you drive to and you go to repeatedly just to pay somebody to tell you what's wrong with you, which is a great transaction. And so I was like, I have to tell the story on stage because it is all the things I love to share, which is the ultimate personal story. This special evolution is really beautiful. And there's a poignant moment where you talk about losing your brother. Why did you feel like you needed to go there? I wanted to do it in an authentic way and be honest about my experience. A lot of my anger came from you know, my brother dying when I was nine and never resolving that because I was just a little girl. So it was important for me to like tell that story uh, on stage and kind of take take that moment and and play with it in the form of stand up. We had a great little relationship. You know, it was so fun because he was the oldest and I was the youngest and we were like bookends. He was the biggest imprint of my young years. What was it like to stand on that stage for the first time since the pandemic? Well, it was great to accomplish something during the pandemic because I just wanted to get this special out before the election and it was just relevant to this time. We picked this outdoor venue and it's the city skyline of New York that I was looking at performing to, which was beautiful. And the audience was socially distanced and wore masks. I wanted to bring something to the table during this really dark time that we're all in. You know, I wanted to bring laughter and joy. And she reliably doesn't hold back from sharing her feelings for New York's governor, Andrew Cuomo. So while you were staring at that skyline, were you fantasizing about Governor Cuomo? We're seven months into the pandemic. Do you still have a thing for him? Listen, I had very strong sexual feelings for him. And a lot of women are feeling it. When he came on the scene, he looked like the Incredible Hulk also. You know, that big Italian gorilla. I want him to flatten my curve, and then I want to flatten his curve. <laughs> yes, I was very sexually attracted to him. Has he uh, reached out to you, though? I had an exchange or two with him, yes. Could there be a date? I think the man's single. Uh, I, is he single? Yeah, I think he is single. Oh, there has not been a date, though. No, 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 no. Jenna, I would tell you. I know. Have you gone on any social distance dating? Yeah, I have had a couple of dates. The great thing about COVID is if you're not interested in the guy, you can just be like, I'm social distancing. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. Nothing to report, but I'm on the hunt. Kind of felt like you were because I was looking at your Instagram and you posted about 50 Cent and I'm like, she's reliving these good old days. We got to find her a new man. <laughs> No, I'm hanging on to the past, girl. Sissy, I miss you, and this special is going to make people laugh and fill them with joy at a time I think we need it the most. Okay, I'll see you next time, Sissy. Love you. 
love you. Oh, I know. She's are we a little jealous? I mean, we I'm thought we were sissies. Jealous. Y'all are sissies too, okay. but but nobody can take Chelsea's place. Well, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Here's what's cool about you and her together. Um, I know that Chelsea's made kind of poked fun at your dad on occasion, and you guys did she? You did. I'm hear? just kidding. <laughs> but anyway, you guys, you guys are still pals, regardless. Yeah. You know, I actually asked her about that. I said, yeah. like, how important is civil discourse, loving yeah. somebody, even though you may not agree on everything. Yes. Because I think we post things on, you know, that our opinions and we can't, we don't make room for people that think differently. And she's yeah. like, you know what? You're my sissy. We may not agree on everything, yeah. but we agree on what matters the most, that that we take care of each other, that we like each other. And so anyway, she is very funny and her new um, special evolution is available on HBO to stream right now. She might have gotten in a little Twitter war with 50 since this has happened. Oh, so yes, yeah, she did. Since this has happened, but we'll leave that to Twitter, yeah, right? That's yeah, right. Exactly. You might have to have an updated piece tomorrow on this whole story, Jenna. <laughs> Thanks so much. The minute you're able to get real with yourself is the minute you're able to get real with everybody. And then all of the noises in our head and the voices in our head, you know, kind of subside and it takes a lot of work. Hi guys, this is Open Book with Jenna Bush Hager and I am so happy to have my friend Chelsea Handler. Her book came out into paperback, which I read, my sister read, she underlined parts of it and sent it to me about sisterhood. I cried, I laughed. Did you imagine as a little girl growing up in New Jersey that you would be an author? No, <laughs> definitely not. But once I came and once I got into the industry and I saw the way things moved, you just kind of, it gave you license to just do whatever the hell you wanted. And then I read David Sedaris's books and I was like, wait, 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 wait. you can write a book that has really nothing to do with the next story, <laughs> like just a <laughs> compilation of essays. So when I read his books, I was like, wait, I think I can do a version of this. Mm -hmm. And humor is, you know, something that you've used to tackle personal things in your life that aren't really that funny, um, but also big subjects. And I think right now when our world feels polarized and when we are tackling things that we need to tackle, tackling big subjects, reading um, and humor can help. And I wonder, have you found yourself drawn to any books right now that either lift you up or teach you about worlds that you didn't know about. Yeah, and you know what? I was reading a lot of South Korean authors because I just stumbled upon this book a few years ago that was really beautiful. So I read, recently I read this Pachinko, this book called Pachinko. Yes, I have it. Did you read it? Yep, I read it and I have it somewhere over there. My bookshelf is on this side of me and I loved it. And then I just recently read another one by this author, King Suk Shin. She's a South Korean writer and it's called I'll Be Right There. And it was, they have this use of language that we don't have here. So even though it's translated, it's translated in such a poetic way that first of all, they're such escapist books, you know? Um, they just take you to another world. And it's just the parallels between like, you know, South Koreans and their oppression from the Japanese. Like the parallels are, are relatable in every walk of life, but it's kind of like this intergenerational story. So that was a beautiful book. And obviously during this time, it's important to be reading as many black authors as possible. So I have a whole collection on my desk. I mean, these are the books I have to read by the end of the week. And these are all by black authors. So I have to get started. <laughs> But, you know, I like to read about experiences I know nothing about. I get the most information from that. And, uh, you know, it's a great way to spend your quarantine because I've picked up books now off my bookshelf. I mean, you can see some of my bookshelves here. That I was like, I can't read a book by Henry Kissinger called Diplomacy that's a thousand and, you know, 50 pages. And then I was like, yeah, you can. You got nothing Did you else. read it? Did you read it? No, I haven't finished that one. That one is long. <laughs> no, well, I started it. I've read like 200 pages, but I read multiple books at a time. I read one serious, really serious, one kind of escapism, and then I read something, you know, about Black Lives Matter or something, a book that I, or about from a Black author that I haven't read. So I like to get it from every angle, you know? We, I saw recently, we share a, a one, or at least a book we both admired and loved. On your Instagram, I think you read Homegoing by oh, one yeah, of my- Oh yeah, that's a beautiful book, right. You that's such a beautiful book. Yeah, and she has about those two sisters. One ends up in Africa or stays in Africa, and one is shipped over on a slave ship 
um, <clears throat> to the South and where she spends her life. And that's another intergenerational story. I've been reading a lot of books that just go from generation to generation, you know, and I love that. I love seeing how like families evolve and, um, yeah, so that was a beautiful book, Homegoing. Yeah, I've got Isn't that, that beautiful. Yeah. So do you, when you read, are there books that give you hope? Because I think right now we can be bogged down with Twitter or the news or, you know, what's not going right. Um, but are there things where you can escape and just think, oh my gosh, this world can be a better place? Yeah, and I think we all knew, you know, that was what my whole book was about. When I wrote it, I was in that space where, like, I didn't understand what my contribution was going to be. I didn't I didn't think I was contributing enough. I felt like I was taking. And, and I had, a, you know, a real, like, many moments of, a, like, awareness and clarity that I hadn't had before where I could see my, my life a lot more clearly than I had before. And... And that was my encouragement to go to therapy because I was like, I want to be in a purpose, in a place of purpose. I want to be helping people move the ball forward. And so I want to be optimistic, you know, like that was how I wanted to feel. I felt like the doom and gloom. And even through this quarantine, I have to say, like I've remained optimistic mostly because Andrew Cuomo's alive, but I've remained optimistic because so many beautiful things have been born out of this. And we're seeing it. And look at what's happened just to police reform alone. I mean, this year in all of these different states. So I am optimistic. Well, you in this book, which is so, which is out in paperback, I'm just holding it. It's so personal. And I wonder for women that, that want to tell their own stories, whether it's, you know, in a published book or journaling, or even just talking to girlfriends, like how empowering is it to own our truths? Um, it's so empowering because the minute you're able to get real with yourself is the minute you're able to get real with everybody. And then all of the noises in our head and the voices in our head, you know, kind of subside and it takes a lot of work, you know, like I, I went to therapy and I did a lot of heavy lifting. I'm sure there's more to do. I'm taking a break, but you know, I, I did a lot of that work and then I had to follow it up with doing a lot of that work. Like I have to wake up every day and meditate for 20 minutes. I have to control my moods. I have to not be reactive when it's not appropriate, you know, and I've, I've, I, it's so important to take power and control over ourselves because that kind of confidence and that kind of groundedness, you can't fake. And when people see it, they know it. Mm -hmm. Well, Chelsea, you're the best. Everybody go out and get life will be the death of me and you too. Oh, oh good. There's the and you too. I'm like, did I just make up that subtitle? No, but there just it is. My books. I love you, sissy. Good to see you. Thank always, you, Chelsea. Always. Welcome back. Chelsea Handler is one of the funniest women in the world. We all know that. But in her new memoir, we see a really different side to her. Yeah, NBC special anchor Maria Shriver got to sit down with Chelsea, a really revealing interview. Good morning, Maria. Good morning, Hoda, and good morning to everybody else there. Well, Chelsea Handler has been a talk show host, a best-selling author, and a cultural provocateur with her trademark sass and wit for years. But now, in a very personal book, Chelsea is going really deep, opening up about her grief, her family, and relationships, and some surprising discoveries she's made about herself. So, Chelsea, this book is really about your midlife awakening. Or crisis. Or crisis. I was trying to be kind. You don't like the word <laughs> journey, but it's really about you kind of going, whoa. I had an awakening after the election in 2016 because I just couldn't believe that something that terrible could happen in my perfect universe. It made me really dive into myself to understand why I was so felt such outrage, why I felt so unhinged. You guys might be the best audience we've ever had. I'm not sure what you're smoking, but keep smoking. <laughs> We've seen her unhinged on TV for years. I'm not an angel. Must have been a beautiful angel. Now in her new memoir, Life Will Be the Death of Me, Chelsea Handler opens up about her struggles behind the scenes. Do you want some almond milk in there? We met up at her home in LA for a funny and very emotional conversation about the book, which recounts her year in therapy that healed and revitalized her. You had been going to your therapist, and you write about a moment when he brought you an orange. Yeah. And you burst into tears. And reading it, I burst into tears. I think it was just the gen like the, the simple act of kindness of a man like looking after me yeah. <laughs> and saying, like, 
hey, I got you something, and me saying, yes, I can, I'll take it, instead yeah. of going, I don't need anything from you. I don't need anything from any man, because the last time I trusted somebody, that's what happened. I can't be in a relationship because I have such a deep injury that I have never addressed. That injury was the loss of her oldest brother, Chet, who died in a hiking accident when Chelsea was just nine years old. Instead of dealing with their grief, she says her parents and other siblings withdrew, and she shut down. I never talked about my brother. I never spoke about it. If I got like this, I'd have to, you know, I'd fight it. I couldn't cry in front of anybody, never my, I mean, not even my parents. There's no shortcut through grief. You can't go around it, you can't ignore it, you have to go through it and go through the pain and cry with somebody until you can get it out of your system. Is it a book about grief? No, I think it's a book about life and being patient with people and like really not judging people. That's really hard for me because I am annoyed by almost everybody. So when people, they start talking to you about the loss of their sibling, they're you know, kind of tough times. Are you up for that? Yeah, of course. I'm up for any conversation. I'm like you. You'll talk to anyone and you're yeah. engaged. Sometimes yeah. even when you're talking to me, I'm like, all right, back off a second. <laughs> you're like, back off? <laughs> sometimes it's just so intense. I'm like, oh, pinball yeah. machine of questions. I'm like, all right, woo, 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 I gotta feel it over here. Chelsea jokingly dedicates her book to her future husband, but says he'll have to be into her other true loves, Chow Rescues, Bert and Bernice. So, but your future husband has to be a dog person. Don't you, I mean, I don't trust men that aren't into dogs. Like if a big, huge dog walks by a guy and they don't blink, then I know that they're Not dangerous. Yet. In the book, you write a lot about Bob Mueller since we I'm don't attracted have- attracted to Bob Mueller. You're attracted, I think that you might be too. I'm not attracted to Bob Mueller, but I want to know, are you still attracted to Bob Mueller even after the report I have to read in? the report to give a full report on my attraction on Bob Mueller, but I would say that I'm still, yes, I'm attracted to him. As for work, Chelsea says she's now only attracted to projects that have meaning. She's making a documentary for Netflix about white privilege, sure to be a talker, just like the lady herself. I am a working girl from New Jersey. I've had a ton of grief and I've had trauma, but I'm having an exceptional time and even more so by addressing all of my shortcomings. Chelsea's new book, Life Will Be the Death of Me, is out today. It's heartwarming, funny, sad, uplifting, and it really gets you thinking. And by the way, you can watch the entire interview that Chelsea and I did if you go to today.com. And it's a very emotional interview. It was long and it was windy and it was really kind of moving. So yeah. throwing it back to I you I can't guys. think of anyone better than you, Maria, to do that interview, too. You can see you two are <laughs> just clicking there. So yeah, it's she, awesome. she's a she's a good friend. She's really smart, wise, and she really kind of is self-reflective in this book. And it's really inspiring, actually. Well, well Maria, thank you good so to much. See you. Fun to see that Thank side you. of Chelsea. Yeah. I've I never know. seen it before. Wow. Well, good for her. I'm sure the writing of the book itself was yes, really the good. Yeah, yeah, therapeutic. Hey, thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Find your favorite recipes, celebrity interviews, uplifting stories, shop our favorite deals, and so much more with the Today app. Download it now.